Welcome back to Econ 104, Introduction to Macroeconomics. In today's video, we're going to be taking a look at bonds. So we've already taken a look at money and we said, okay, what is money? We took a look at our three functions of money. We're now going to be taking a look at the other flip side of that, which is bonds. And really, we're going to make a big simplifying assumption here. We're going to presume that all of the wealth that a nation has, all of the wealth that an individual could have, is going to be split between either... Okay, you have your money, you have your, sorry, you have your wealth, you have your net worth. You can either hold it as money or you can choose to hold it as bonds being that other alternative. And we're going to really work through building up a model to look at all this and explain all this. But before we get there, we need to be able to say, okay, what is a bond? What exactly do we mean by bonds and what's going on there? So our objective as we get through this video now, only a few things we're going to be taking a look at. The first thing is going to be, well, what is a bond? So we're going to define what is a bond. Specifically, we're going to be looking at a type of bond known as a coupon bond. From there, we're going to figure out how to determine the present value of a future income stream. So, hey, you receive some money next year. You receive some money in two years' time, in three years' time, in four years' time. What is that money worth to you today? What is the present value of that future income stream? The other way to phrase that, what would be the amount that you'd be willing to pay in order to access that future income stream? So another thing we're going to be taking a look at as we go through that. The final aspect is we're going to be taking a look at the relationship between bond prices and yields. Um, that is this whole concept of yield to maturity and interest rates are often synonymous in this text, in this context here. And so we'll be taking a look at, hey, if our interest rate, if our yield to maturity on a bond rises, what happens to the price of that bond? Or conversely, if that yield to maturity falls, similarly, what happens to the price of the bond? So we'll evaluate that relationship as well. Okay, so that's it for our plan. Let's go jump over it. Let's start off by giving it some uh, context and uh, let's begin with a bit of an example. So to frame our conversation going forward, Really what we're going to be taking a look at is how to calculate the present value of future money. And that is, let's suppose that I were to offer you, let's say I just had an extra $100 kicking around that I was like, you know what, I'm just going to give this to you. And I'm going to say to you, okay, I can give you either, this is your choice entirely, I'll give you $100 today, or if you want, I'll give you this $100 next year. Well, which one do you choose? Right? Are you going to take this $100 today, or are you going to want to take this $100 next year? And why? Why do you make that choice that you choose? Well, for most of you, and by far and large, most people all together, they're going to say, I'm going to take this $100 today. And the rationale behind this is that $100 is worth more to you today than it is worth to you next year. And there's a few reasons behind this. The one reason is that, well, you could take this $100 and then even if you don't need it today, you could invest it and get $100 plus some interest rate in the future, right? So you could grow this $100, meaning that hey, by taking it today, you're going to have more than 100 in the future. The other way to think about this as well, though, is that you have a discount rate. You value today more than you value the future. The future is unknown. The future is uncertain. And in some ways, who cares about the future? I'm hungry today. So to a degree, we have the preference for today over tomorrow. So that's going to make you kind of put this tendency towards wanting this money today. And then that second aspect of it is the fact that even if you don't need this money today, by taking it today, you can grow it. So that is, as we look off into the future, we say that we discount the future. The future is discounted. Future money is not worth as much as present money. Present money is always going to be worth more to us. So with that in mind, what we want to work through is how to discount that future. And then based off of that is to figure out, hey, what would future money be worth to me today? And so let's take a look at an example as to how exactly we can work that out. 
And for this example, let's suppose that we have a we have a magic box. We have a magic box and let's say on this magic box you have a little crank that you can crank and then you have this little spout and as you turn it you just set it on the table and this magic machine it just starts printing money. And this is perfectly legal. This is perfectly legal money. And let's suppose it goes something like this. This machine prints money only you know, a little bit each day, but altogether in your first year, right? So by the end of your first year, it has been able to print for you $100. Come the end of your second year owning this, well, in year two, it's able to print for you another $100. So it's able to print for you $100 a year. At the end, at the end, so after two years, the machine stops working. Now, luckily for you, this machine has stopped working, but it has many very valuable parts in it. Um, a lot of the equipment used to make it could be recycled. And as a result, there's actually quite a large market for buying these broken machines. So we're going to say that in year two, Right, so in year two, you're able to sell this machine and get a thousand dollars. So, okay, these machines exist and these machines are out on the market, and you want to know, you're trying to figure out how much would I be willing to pay for this machine, knowing that just by buying it, I get a hundred dollars next year, I get a hundred dollars two years later. And actually, in two years later, I get $1,100 because I get the 100 that the machine made, plus I get to sell the machine for scrap. So how much is all this future money worth to me today? Okay, so, well, right away, we can take a look at it. We can say, okay, 100, 200. Uh, would you pay $1,200 for this? There, here's $1,200 and I get $1,200 in the future. Well, hopefully not. Hopefully you realize that that's going to be a no-go. And the reason why that's going to be a no-go is because we've already talked about this $100, that's future money. That is, that's worth less to you than $100 today is. Right? $100 today is worth more than this $100 in the future. Similarly, this $100 in two years term is worth even less to you. This $1,000 in two years term is worth less to you than a thousand dollars today so what we need to do is we need to discount these future rates of money we have to discount this future money altogether in order to figure out what this is worth to us today and how are we going to do this well what we're going to do is we're going to take the amount of money that you earn in that period and we're going to just go divide it by one plus the interest rate that you could earn. And why why exactly would we be doing this? Well, let's let's back up and talk about why this is the case. And in order to talk about why this is the case, let's go back to that previous example that I talked about, which was saying, "Hey, if I gave you $100 today and you were like, okay, right, I said, "Hey, $100 today or $100 next year." But let's say you chose $100 today. Well, you then chose, you didn't even need this $100 today, you don't even need this $100 till next year, but the reason still why you took it today was because you could take this $100 and you could save it, and that is you could grow it at one plus the interest rate to get some future value, right? Some future value of money. That is, this $100 saved today would be worth some future amount. Let's, let's put some... Uh, Let's put some values to that. Let's say we can get a 10% rate of return. So that's one plus 10%. That's gonna be equal to, well, what is that? 100 times 1.1, that's gonna be $110. Right, and so what we've just kind of worked out for us is that $100 today is gonna to be worth the same thing as $110 next year. That is, if we revised my question and I said, okay, hey guys, here's the deal. I'll give you $100 today or I'll give you $110 next year. Which one do you want? Well, based off of this, you should be indifferent. You should say, uh, I actually don't care. 
hundred dollars today, hundred and ten dollars next year. They're the same thing. There's no difference between the two. I would value them both identically. Or to work it out the other way, to say, hey, I'm going to give you $110 next year. What is that worth to you today? Well, hey, to go the other way, we could go 100 equals this 110 all over this 1 plus the interest rate. That was, what was that 1 plus the interest rate? That was 1 plus 0 0.10. Right? All I did is just a little bit of algebraic voodoo. I took this and I divided it by both sides, moving it over. And what that works out to be in this case here is to say, hey, this future money discounted by the interest rate I could have received gives me that value of the money today. So what we get is we get a little expression here. If we write this algebraically, the present value is going to equal the future value divided by our rate of discounting. So future value all over one plus the interest rate. So, okay, we have this big, long kind of way to go back just to ultimately explain why we wrote that. Why we said, hey, we're gonna take this $100 and we're gonna divide it by one plus the interest rate to say, what is this $100 worth to me today? Okay. So all that being said, cool, we can work out what that what that $100 that we receive at the end of the year is worth. What about this $100 in two years' time? Well, keep in mind, this is in two years' time, so that means, okay, this is $100 next year, but this is another year yet before I receive this. Well, we can calculate that just the same. We can say, hey, I'm going to receive $100 in year two. I need to discount this by one plus the interest rate. But keep in mind, this is now two years come by. So this is one plus the interest rate squared, right? This is now this amount of money that would have been indifferent between today or in two years time has compounded, has grown over two periods. So we want to account for that in going squared. Okay, finally, Finally, we want to figure out what we can sell this machine for. So again, that's going to be the $1,000 we receive in two years' time, all over again, one plus the interest rate squared. And okay, some people really get torn by this. They're like, hey, I just saw that example you worked through here, and I got that. That made sense. But, but I'm a little bit lost about this guy. I don't quite know why we have this squared going on here. Well, let's actually throw this back to our whole bit about growth, right? We talked about economic growth and we said V naught growing at one plus G over N years equals value at the end, right? And this would be say GDP today growing at some constant growth rate over N years gives us GDP in the future. Well, hey, we could just kind of put, right? Same math, but different kind of terminology. We could say, hey, this is the present value of my money. Instead of a growth rate, well, okay, growth rate of money, that's going to be my interest rate. So 1 plus my interest rate over N years is going to be equal to the future value of my money. Okay, in this case here, I know my future value, right? That's a future value. That's a future value. Heck, even this guy here, that guy there, that's a future value. That's money that's getting earned in the future. I need to work out what is that worth to me today. So again, going through that algebraic voodoo, we get present value equals future value all over 1 plus i to the n. And really, right, that's just what we had when we worked out this guy. The only difference is, hey, we kind of just cheated and we just got rid of that N. And the reason why we did that before is because really that's to the power of one. And anything to the power of one is just to itself. So really we were just lazy in going through that in the initial case. But by keeping this to the N, well, we could now work this out for any period. That is, hey, say this was a five-year machine instead. Right, You earn $100 in year one, $100 in year two, $100 in year three, year four, year five, and then you sell it in year five. Well, we could do the same thing. We could do the same thing. We could just throw in 
100 1 plus i squared plus 100 1 plus i cubed plus on and on and on and on all the way through. Okay, so that's the idea as to how we would value this machine as to how to say I would be indifferent between this future flow of money and this amount today that I'd be willing to spend for that flow of money. Well, let's work out how we'd actually value this. Let's let's calculate what this would be. Okay, so let's clean up this bottom area here and let's let's take a look at calculating it. So in taking a look at calculating it, let's start off by presuming that our interest rate is five percent. So that is, hey, if I just save my money today instead of buying this machine, well, I could get a five percent return on my money. So, okay, if we do this, hey, we have an I in our calculation here. We can just go through and we could throw that in and we could figure out what this is all worth. So, hey, let's, let, let's do so. So I can say the price of this machine is going to be equal to 100 all over 1.05. Plus, uh, this next guy here, another 100 all over 1.05. And that guy's squared, right? That's just that guy coming down. And then finally, I sell the machine for parts. Well, that's going to be 1,000 all over 1.05 squared. So, okay, we can, we can work that out. So, what do we have? We have 100 divided by 1.05. Well, that gives me, hey, this 100 next year, that's worth... 95.24 to me today. Uh, 95.24 to me today. This guy here, uh, we can we can cheat a little bit. We can say, hey, look, same denominator. So really, really this whole bit here, we can just calculate this in one step. We can say same denominator. We can just add those together. We can say that that is 1100 all over 1.05 squared. So, okay, let's do that guy. 1100 divided by 1.05 squared. That gives me 997.73. Uh, so, altogether, what do I have? I have 95 from that first year. I have 997.73 between that second amount of money being created and the sale amount. So altogether, I would be able to sell this machine, or rather I'd be willing to buy this machine for 997.73 plus 95.24. I'd be willing to spend 10, well, oh, that was funny. Let's try that again. 1092.97. That would be the absolute most that I'd be willing to pay for this machine. And why would that be the most that I'd be willing to pay for this machine? Because that's what all that future money is worth to me today. So, okay, in that sense there, if that's what all this future money is worth for me today, let's say that I find this machine on sale for 1100 that is, I can go to the store and I can buy this magic money-making machine for $1,100. Is it worth it to me? Do I buy it? Should I buy this machine that gives me $1,200 worth of money into the future? Should I buy it for $1,100? No. No, you should not buy it for $1,100. And the reason you should not buy it for $1,100 is even though it gives you $1,200 in the future, that twelve hundred of future money is only worth ten ninety two to you today. Okay, what about instead? What about instead you find this machine on sale for a thousand dollars? Okay, what's going on now? Is it worthwhile for you to buy this machine now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This machine is a great deal for you to buy now. Because again, this future flow of money is worth ten ninety two ninety seven to you today. If you can buy it for a thousand, you've just made ninety two dollars and ninety seven cents, right? You've just that future money was worth ten ninety two to you. You were able to buy it for a thousand. You just bought yourself an extra ninety two dollars. 
So, hey, that's a great deal in this situation. An awesome deal in this situation here. So, yeah, yeah, you would wrap, you would buy it, you would just get as many of them as you can, essentially. Because everyone you buy, you're making money just by buying it. In this way here, these machines, if these machines were to exist, we would witness that, hey, anytime they tried to be sold for higher than this present value of future income streams, no one would buy them. Anytime that they were sold for less than this present value of future income streams, everybody would try to buy them up. They would try to get as many as they can. So what we would witness is that if ever a price of this machine was above the present value, so we'll go price above present value, well, no one would buy it, so the only way to sell it would be to drop the price and drop the price until you reach the present value. If you were trying to be sold for less than the present value, so price less than present value, Everybody would be trying to buy these. As everybody's trying to buy them, they're going to be bidding up the price. As they're bidding up the price, well, well, there we go. We just said it. The price is going to rise. In this case here, what we end up witnessing is that some kind of machine like this, if it were to exist, the price in which it would sell for in equilibrium is going to be equal to the present value of all that future money it is able to create. Okay, so that's cool. That's a pretty neat hypothetical machine. Does this machine actually exist in reality? And the answer to this is, yeah, actually, this machine does exist in reality. And this machine, the way that we've just displayed it here, would actually be known as a coupon bond. And in a coupon bond, what this is, is it's actually just, in this case, not a machine necessarily, but a piece of paper that you buy. And by owning this piece of paper, you get paid $100 next year. You get paid $100 in two years' time. And then in that two years' time as well, the person who you bought that piece of paper from buys that piece of paper back from you for $1,000. So in that case there... We have just talked about a coupon bond and we've just introduced, we have coupon payments and then the actual principal amount being repurchased at the end. So let's talk about a few of these things with this notional coupon bond. Okay, so for a coupon bond, we're going to have a few different terms. We're going to have the present value, so PV present value. We're going to have I, that's going to be the interest rate. We're going to have the FV, which in this case here is the face value, not, not necessarily the future value, right? The future value is going to be all of those parts added up, but this here is going to be the face value. So that there's a C, I know it kind of looks like an R. Um, that's the face value of this coupon bond. That is, hey, how much principal you are being repaid in the end. And then finally, we're going to have C, which is our coupon payment. And the coupon payment often what we'll also see is going to be our coupon rate. And that is the coupon rate is going to be the ratio between the coupon payment and the face value of the bond. So essentially the way that this works, if you want to think about it from the issuer's side, is, hey, I need, say I am a business and I need to raise today. I, I need $1,000, and I need $1,000 to buy a new piece of equipment. If you give me this $1,000, if you give me this money today for me to be able to buy this equipment, well, I will, in the future, pay you $100, right? This is kind of your interest payment. I will pay you another $100. And then I will pay you back your $1,000 that you gave me as well. So in this case here, 
by financing my purchase of this new equipment, you are going to get your return plus your principal back. So, hey, that's a pretty good deal. You get your principal amount invested back, plus you get $200 in essentially interest or coupon payments as you move through. If we were to write this just generically to how we could price this bond. So again, in this case here, we'd be looking at a two year coupon bond. We have two coupons being made and then return a principal. We could say, hey, that present value is gonna be equal to the coupon amount all over one plus I plus our coupon amount all over plus I squared, right? This is year one, this is year two. And then I get my return of the principal in year two. So again, I get my coupon. Oh, sorry, not my coupon. I get a return of my principal. That's my face value. I get my face value back all over one plus I squared. Okay, what about this, this coupon rate? Well, this coupon rate is really the rate of return that they're paying you for taking this risk. So in this case here, right, we have a coupon payment. That's our coupon payment of 100. We have a face value of 1,000. So we have our coupon rate of 100 over 1,000, which gives us a 10% coupon rate. So cool. We, we, we have that going on there. Let's, let's work through a few different scenarios here mathematically to see what happens as our interest rate changes with respect to our coupon rate and with respect to, well, everything else going on here. So that is, let's work through, let's say, let's, let's update this a little bit just to the values we already have. Let's say that our coupons are 100. So we have a $100 payment, a $100 payment, a $1,000 return of principal. And we're going to work this through for a interest rate of 5%, an interest rate of 10%, and an interest rate of 15%. So three different interest rates. And what we want to do is we want to witness how does our present value, that is the price we'd be willing to pay for this bond, change in relation to the interest rate. As our interest rate changes, how does our price of this bond, our willingness to pay for this bond change? So let's let's work through that and to start off let's work through that for our five percent so okay again how we would do that that would be this guy here so that's going to be let's use yellow for this that's going to be 100 all over 1.05 plus keep in mind we can condense these two because they share the same denominator so that would be 1100 all over 1.05 squared and what do we work that out to be we work that out to be 10, 92, and 97 cents, right? That was the example we just worked through on that previous page. So nothing, nothing too big of a surprise there. We get the same, we get the same value. But what happens? What happens is we jump up to a 10% interest rate. Well, okay, let's let's work that guy through. So we're going to have 100 all over 1.10, right? 1 plus 10% now. Plus, well, same coupon payment, same face value. So still 1,100 all over 1.10. And now we're squared, right? Because this is taking place in two years' time. So, okay, what do we have? We have 100 divided by 1.1. That gives us... 90, ah, we'll say 90 and 91, plus 1,100 divided by 1.10, and that guy's squared. So, hey, that's worth to us 909, um, 09. So, what does that work out to us altogether? 90.91 plus 909, 09. That gives us thousand dollars that is hey i'm willing to pay a thousand dollars today to get my coupon payments of a hundred dollars next year and the year after and then i return of that thousand dollars in the end so hey i'm willing to pay what i'm going to get back for principal in this case here right 
what you'll notice is that, hey, in this case, my interest rate was one and the same as my coupon rate. And as a result of that, my present value was one and the same as my face value. So, hey, pretty cool, pretty cool relationship we have going on there. If we wanted to kind of go back a step and take a look, what, what happened here? Well, in this case here, my interest rate was less than my coupon rate. And as a result of that, I was willing to pay more than what that face value was. So, hey, I was willing to pay more than the principal in order to get this because the interest rate, the current prevailing interest rate, was lower than that coupon rate on that bond. Well, let's take a look at what happens when we go up to a 15% interest rate. Let's change colors again. So again, I'm getting 100 next year, and that's going to be at a 15% interest rate. Plus, in the second year, I get my another 100 coupon plus return of principal. So 1.15 squared. So, okay, what does that work out to? 100 divided by 1.15. That's going to yield for us... Ah, that's going to be worth 86 to me. 86, 96. What's that 1100 going to be worth to me? 1100 divided by 1.15 and that 1.15 is squared because it's in two years time. That's going to be worth to me 831.76. Altogether, what's that? Uh, so that's 831.76 plus my 86.96. That gives me 918.72. Uh, so in this case here, what do I have? I have an interest rate that is greater than my coupon rate and the result is that I have a present value less than my face value less than that principal amount of the bond so we see this kind of inflection point around the point where the interest rate equals our coupon rate but even more important than that as we work through it what we notice is that as these interest rates go up my present value of future money goes down. That is, what I see is I see an inverse relationship between interest rates and present value. As interest rates go up, present values go down. This inverse relationship. And this is a pretty important relationship to witness here. Is that, hey, the higher the interest rate, that is, right, and explaining why this is the case, is that the higher the interest rate, well, hey, $86 invested, saved at this interest rate would give me 100 next year. At a lower interest rate, I would need $90 saved to give me 100 next year. So, hey, the higher the interest rate, the less money I need to save to get the same amount next year. So we get this inverse relationship between interest rates and prices between interest rates and the value, the current value, the current selling price of these financial instruments, of these bonds. And this is this is a fundamental and important aspect of these bonds altogether. Okay, so we've taken a look here at an example of a two-year coupon bond. Really, we could do these for N years. And what I mean by that is we could kind of do this present value formula and I'm gonna do a bunch of math speak here. The sum of I equals one to N and we could say our coupon payment all over one plus, uh, sorry, I don't want that little I there. I'm messing up my notation already. I'm gonna do from little N of one to big N. So one plus I to the power of n plus our face value all over 1 plus i to the big n. And, okay, what, what, what does this math speak mean? Well, okay, if you're not aware of this little big sigma here, this squiggly line, this just means to take the summation. So that means to say, okay, take the summation of our coupon payment divided by 1 plus i, so our interest rate, to the power of n. And N is going to go from 1, so hey, year 1, to year capital N. Capital N being however many years long this maturity of the bond is. So, hey, for that previous example we just looked at here, 
we had a two-year coupon bond. So, okay, writing that guy out, that became present value of little n from 1 to 2, right? And then we had our coupon of 1 plus i to the n plus our face value all over 1 plus i to the 2, right? Because we're saying n is 2 in that case. How do we deal with this inside bit? Well, okay, we're just doing the summation, letting this n change from 1 to 2. So, okay, that's going to be our coupon all over 1 plus i to the 1. This just means summation of everything in the bracket. So let's do a sum plus the coupon of 1 plus i to the 2. Oh, hey, that's that was our endpoint, right? That was our endpoint. That's what we had up here on the top. So now we are done this summation. Now we just carry on to the next part. Plus the face value all over 1 plus i to the 2. So hey, that's that's how that guy worked out. What if it was different? What if it wasn't what we already dealt with, right? And that was the whole point of this is to show that we could go beyond a two-year coupon bond. Well, if we went beyond a two-year coupon bond, let's just let's just back up here. Let's just go like that. And let's say that we were going for, ah, let's do something a little bit extreme. And this isn't even that extreme, but just to show us the idea. Let's say that we were dealing with a five-year coupon bond. So, okay, that's going to be the summation from n equals 1 to 5. So, okay, hey, that's going to be our face value all over 1 plus i to the cap n. Cap n is going to be 5. So, how do we do this inside bit here? How do we deal with this whole summation operator? Well, we're already good for the first two, right? And I kind of cheated, so I don't have to rewrite these first two. But that was the idea, right? So, coupon payment. Changing n from 1 to 5. Well, we have n of 1 there. We have n of 2 there. So, okay, the next one is going to be n of 3. So, coupon 1 plus i to the 3 plus coupon 1 plus i to the 4 plus coupon all over 1 plus i to the 5. Hey, that's my cap n to the power of 5. So, okay, I've opened up this entire summation operator to all of its parts carry on that part's done boom on to my face value plus face value all over one plus i to the five so right we could do this for any term bond that we wanted to you can see that hey as we get to longer term bonds as we start looking at five 10, 20, 30 year bonds, this becomes a bit of a mathematical nightmare to solve by hand. If you have a financial calculator, uh, it makes it a lot easier. But rest assured, as we move through this course, as we work through calculating bond yields, through calculating present values of future money, uh, we're rarely going to do anything above three years. Right, maybe, maybe if I was feeling particularly grumpy putting together a question, I might do a four-year term. But typically speaking, we're going to be doing shorter terms. If you can calculate a two-year bond yield, you can calculate. Sorry, not bond yield. If you can calculate a two-year price of a bond term, you can calculate the price of a five-year bond term. The only difference is just how many terms you're including. So there's there's going to be that, but we're not going to be getting this involved, right? We don't need we don't need torture just for the sake of torture. But just to make you aware, it is possible, right? We could do it, and it isn't mathematically hard, it's just time intensive, which which sucks. Okay, so that, that does this to kind of take a look at our different terms of bonds and that we could realistically be looking at higher terms. We have also looked at the whole idea that, hey, as interest rates change, so does the price. What we want to introduce next, though, is that with this interest rate, this whole idea of risk, and that is that, hey, not all bonds are issued equally. Different bonds have different risks attached to them, and that is even if we had a constant prevailing interest rate of, let's say, 
5%, well, certain bonds, we might be like, I don't know if I'm actually going to be getting my money back. That one, it's a bit riskier to invest in. This one, oh, this one's a bit safer to invest in. And so we're going to associate a risk premium with each bond that we're going to be ultimately buying in. And so in that case there, what we're going to do is we're going to open up that guy right there. That little I, right, in this 1 plus I. And we're going to say that this I, this interest rate, this prevailing interest rate, it's actually going to be made up of our interest rate risk-free. So that would be a risk-free asset that we could invest in. And we'll talk about what that might mean in a second. So our risk-free rate plus the risk of the bond that we're buying. So that there, that's lowercase sigma, Greek letter again, lowercase sigma standing for the risk of the asset that we're purchasing. So let's talk about this risk-free rate. And with that, let's talk about risk. What, what exactly do we have? What do we have for risk? Well, we have a few different types of risk. We have, first of all, we have our default risk. And default risk is the risk that arises when we're like, maybe, maybe the company we bought this bond from, maybe this is a five year, right? Just because we're using this, uh, this amount up here. Maybe this is a five year Netflix bond, right? Netflix actually just a little while ago put out like a ridiculous amount of bond offerings. Like we're talking billions of dollars that they issued in bonds. And so they did this billion dollar debt issue and it was much longer than five years, but let's say it was a five year bond that you were looking to buy. Maybe you're thinking there's some risk that, hey, one of these coupon payments might not actually be repaid. That is, they might miss one of these coupon payments and they might default on their debt. That'd be kind of, you know, I mean, best case would be they don't miss any, but if they were to miss one, best case is they only had to miss one of their coupon payments. Worst case scenario is they go completely bankrupt or the like, and hey, they go bankrupt after year three, so you miss all of these payments altogether. They're gone. Yeah, that's just part of your risk of buying a Netflix bond. Well, okay, so all of that, that there is our default risk. We need to work that in into part of our risk. So, okay, I kind of put this in the wrong place. I'm talking about what kinds of risks exist. So default risk is one of the types of risks that exists. That risk that I might not actually get all my promised payments back. Okay, the other risk that occurs is inflation risk. Inflation risk. So keep in mind, these are all I. We've used I before to denote, it to denote interest rate, but specifically the nominal interest rate. So, hey, if all of a sudden we have a big spike in inflation, well, that spike in inflation ends up eating into my future purchasing power. So that is the longer the term of the bond, the more uncertainty there is about inflation, there's more risk there that future inflation is going to eat into my returns. So a longer term bond is likely to have a higher risk premium. Finally, the last thing to consider would be an exchange rate risk. Exchange rate risk. And this would be the case if we're buying a foreign bond. Like, hey, we're in Canada and we're buying an American bond priced in American dollars. Well, now, okay, sure, buying an American bond, there's a default risk, there's an inflation risk, but there's also an exchange rate risk. That when we get these coupon payments, hey, the Canadian dollar might appreciate or depreciate relative to the US dollar, and that's going to influence what this coupon payment actually is transferred into, how much I actually get in Canadian dollars upon exchange. So an extra risk being put into there. So there are actually more risks than this, but for simplicity's sake, we're just going to limit it to these three. And then we're going to say, okay, for our risk-free rate, well, what's, what's this going to be? Well, this is going to be a rate that is offered by somebody who has very little, if any, risk of default. That is, you're not really worried about if you're going to get paid back or not. 
it's a short enough time frame that uh, we're not really worried about inflation. And it's issued in the same currency that you're dealing with, so there's zero exchange rate risk. In this case here, and we will change this going on as to what we mean by a risk-free rate, but ultimately what's often held up as this risk-free rate is a 30-day T-bill rate. And okay, what's a 30-day T-bill rate? Well, okay, let's talk about what a T-bill is first. A T-bill is a treasury bill. This is a debt issued by the government. So, hey, government, typically federal government, actually not typically, is federal government, issued and says, hey, look, we need $1,000 for the next 30 days. Here, who wants to give us $1,000 for that? And we'll repay you 30 days from now. Okay, federal government, the likelihood that they default in 30 days, that they run into some crazy financial crisis in the next 30 days that they're not able to repay you, Ah, uh, that's pretty low. So we have very low, if any, default risk. 30 days. That's a pretty short time horizon. Very short time horizon. There are shorter, of course, but 30 days is decently short that uh, there's very, very little, if any, inflation risk. Finally, exchange rate risk. Well, it's Canadian dollar, Canadian government issued in Canadian dollars, and you're a Canadian saver. So hey, everything's in Canadian dollars there, there's zero exchange rate risk. So what we'd typically go and look at is we'd say, okay, what is going to be the interest rate on a 30-day T-bill? What is the interest rate on this Netflix bond? Work out the difference between the two. And that difference between the two, that is my risk premium. Right? This is the extra rate that you have to pay me in order to entice me to say it's worthwhile to risk my money in this Netflix bond rather than just buying nice, safe Government of Canada bonds. Get a higher return, but with that higher return is more risk. And so that higher return is compensation for that higher risk. And in that, what we witness, right, we already talked about, we already talked about this inverse relationship. That as interest rates go up, our price, the present value of the bonds go down. That's, that's true here too, right? Interest rate plus risk premium gives us the prevailing interest rate on that bond, that specific Netflix bond. The higher the risk premium, the higher the interest rate on that bond. The higher the interest rate on that bond, the lower the price. So we see how that works its way through. So sometimes this can actually hit us even after a bond's been issued, even after everything's going on. And let's finish off by taking a look at one more example and bringing in this whole risk premium and everything like that to look at, well, what happens due to a change in the perceived riskiness of an asset. So let's jump and take a look at that. So again, just to keep things simple, let's say, well, let's actually change things up a bit. Let's go for a three-year bond. We have a three-year coupon bond, and we're going to say we have coupon payments of $50. We have a face value of $1,000. We're going to say that the risk-free rate is 5%. But on this guy here, we have a risk premium of, uh, let's say we have a risk premium. Right now, it's pretty low. We only have a 1% risk premium being levied on this guy. We want to figure out, hey, given all this information, what is the realistic price of this bond? That is, what is the present value of this future income stream given the rate at which I'm going to discount things? Well, okay, let's start off by writing this down. We have a three-year bond. So, okay, we're going to have year one. We're going to have year two. And then in year three, we're going to have, again, our payment as well as our face value, right? In year two, it's just payment. In year one, it's just payment. So three years and then, of course, the three different things going on. So what do we have? In year one, we get a payment of 50. In year two, we get a payment of 50. In year three, we get a payment of 50 plus our return of principal of 1,000. 
we then have to discount this. Well, all together, our interest rate works out 5%, 1%. Our interest rate works out to be 6%. So, okay, 50, 1.06, 50, 1.06. Squared, we're in year two, and then 50 plus a thousand all over 1.06. We're in year three now, so cubed. Working that out, let's work out each of these guys, and then we're ultimately going to sum them all up, right? So, what do we have? We have 50 divided by 1.06. Ah, that $50 next year, that would be worth 47.17. $50 times 1.06, sorry, not times, $50 divided by 1.06, and that 1.06 is squared this time because it's in two years. So that gives me 44, uh, 49.99. So we're going to go 44.50 because, hey, we only report typically money to two decimal places, right, to the number of cents. And then finally, we have 1,050 divided by 1 1.06 to the power of 3. That guy worth to me today is 881 and 60 cents. So, okay, all together, my present value of this guy is my 881.60 plus my 44.50 plus my 47.17. That gives me... 973.27. And hey, one way to check, like, hey, did we actually do this properly? Is this actually a number that's realistic? Is this actually a number that we should expect? Well, what we can do is we can compare our present value to our face value and our interest rate to our coupon rate to make sure that it all lines up. And so, okay, well, what's going on here? Present value is less than face value. Interest rate to coupon rate? Well, okay, interest rate, we know, we know that is 6%. But what was my coupon rate? Well, okay, keep in mind, coupon rate was our coupon payment to our face value. So 50 over 1,000, that was going to be 5%. So, okay, interest rate greater than coupon rate. Cool. Does that line up? Is that what we talked about? Well, hey, if you don't remember, let's just go back and check. Let's go back and check. Oh, it was one page back. There we go. So let's see here. Interest rate greater than coupon rate, right? And, and what, are we, what were we just dealing with? We were saying 6% to our coupon rate of 5%. We had a face value of a thousand and we had a present value. Oh yeah, we had a present value less than a thousand. So does that line up? Yep, yeah, we are good. That all lines up. We are happy with that. That is at least, right? We're not guaranteed that's the correct number, but we have no glaring red flags. We have no glaring red flags of any big mistakes we made. So one way we can check our math as we work through this. And these little checks are always great to have, especially when we start going through lots of steps like this and maybe we have fat fingers that make mistakes. I often do. I often do. Hence why I like to bring up these red flags as to how we can check our work quickly to say, hey, am I, did I make a big mistake going through this? Okay, so let's say I bought this bond and here we go. I have this bond in my portfolio and let's just say, right, for simplicity's sake, I have one of these bonds and it is worth... 973.27. That is, right, hey, part of my wealth is this bond. $973.27. I have this as my bond. Now, all of a sudden, everybody gets a little bit spooked about this company. And they're like, hey, I've heard that they're running into financial trouble. They might not be able to make payments next year. They might even be going bankrupt altogether. Oh no. What does this mean for you? What does this mean to your wealth? What is going to happen to the value of your bond portfolio given this un increased uncertainty? Given that people are saying this company might go bankrupt, this company might not be making our payments anymore. Let's put some numbers to this. Let's say that this means 
that people have updated this risk premium to 3%. They're saying, you know what, there's a lot of uncertainty here. This is, ah, we're really unsure. We're going to add a bunch of risk premium to this. We're not happy with this guy here. For In order to get us to buy this, you need to offer us a much higher return because uh, that 1% risk premium off of a government bond really does not compensate us for that extra risk we're taking on. So, hey, what does that do? Well, 5%, 3%, that's now 8%. Right, and in order to make this work, let's say that you bought this bond, you bought it for 973.27, you're really happy, and then the next day this realization happens. Like this is next day scenario. And hey, if any of you are ever in this investment kind of thing, this happens sometimes and it sucks. Sometimes the opposite happens and it rocks, but hey, sometimes sometimes this happens. So okay, boom, next day you wake up and it turns out this bond that you bought might be a lemon, might be one of those ones that you're just you might lose everything that you put in. So let's see where your bond portfolio is sitting at in this next day. So, okay, working that out, what do we now have? 50 all over 1.08, right? So this is our first payment at our new interest rate. Plus our second year, 1.08. And then in the end, we get 1050 all over 1.08. So, okay, let's work that guy through. How does that go? 50 divided by 1.08. That's now worth to me only 46, uh, 46.296. So we'll say 46.30 plus 50 divided by, look at that. I was being sloppy. This is in year two. This is squared. This is in year three. This is cubed. Don't make those silly mistakes. 1.08 squared. That was half of me reprimanding myself and half reminding you not to do the same thing. Uh, 4287. And then finally, 1050 divided by 1.08 to the power of 3. That guy there is now worth 8, 33, and 52. Okay, so to get our present value then, well, we just need to finally add all that up, just like we did up here. So 833.52 plus 42.87 plus 46.30. What do we get? We have now 9.22 and 69. So what's happened? Well, what's happened is... 92269. I guess I didn't need to do uh that guy there. Kind of forgot what we were uh what numbers we were comparing. I mean, these are the same, but we already have them right here. We see that due to this perceived increase in risk, that translates into a fall in the price of this bond, and that is for anybody who was holding this bond preemptively, well, anyone who is holding this bond ahead of time or who already holding this they've now just seen a decrease in the price of their bond, the decrease in their bond value. They essentially just lost, what is that, about uh, 50 bucks, $51, something like that, almost $51, given this 2% increase in the risk premium attached to this. So kind of a bit of a question we could attach to that. What if you bought this bond, you were holding on to it, and then you're looking at their financials and you go, oh, you know what? Maybe this is a mistake. Maybe I think that I missed something. I think everybody missed something. I think these guys are about to lose a lot of money. What should you do? Should you hold on to this bond at 973.27 or should you sell it? Well, at this point here, you're ahead of the game. Somehow you have magic information that nobody else knows anyone in finance that goes against kind of our efficient market hypothesis, but still you have this magic information that nobody else knows. You utilize that. What you could do is you could sell this bond right away at 973.27, convert it back into cash, back into money. If you were right, if tomorrow morning you wake up and interest rates do go up because of this risk premium, bond price falls. Well, Hey, you can just buy that exact same bond again tomorrow 
for $50 cheaper. And then you're properly compensated for that risk. So if you're able to speculate and if you speculate correctly, well, because you think interest rates are going to go up, your speculation would be to move into cash, into money, out of bonds, right? Out of the bond, into money, wait until that interest rate happens, and then move back into the bonds after the fact. So one way that you could witness speculation occurring in that way there. Of course, if you witnessed interest rates going the other way, you'd have the opposite case occurring. You would move into the bonds because the bonds would appreciate if the interest rate was going down. One last thing I want to bring up just as we go through kind of the impact that this change in interest rates happened. I mean, we see and we've already talked about, hey, as interest rates go up, these present values go down. And we see that in each one, right? 47 down to 46, 44 down to 42, 881 down to 833. What I hope you notice as well, though, is that, hey, this payment that happened next year, sure, it fell, but it didn't fall nearly as much. This payment that happened in year two, well, it fell, but hey, it fell by a little bit more than this guy did. This other payment that happened in year three, right? So year one, year two, year three, it fell even more than these other two, right? And that is what we have is, yes, we have this relationship between interest rates and present value, but we also have a rate of sensitivity or those of you who have taken micro and understand that term, we'd often call this an elasticity. And that is that a longer term bond, so say a 30 year bond is going to be more sensitive. The price of that 30 year bond is going to be more sensitive to a change in the interest rate than a two year bond. Longer term bonds are going to be more sensitive to changes in interest rate than short term bonds. One year bonds, uh, they'll change, but not very nearly as much. Three-year bonds, well, you'll see the three-year payment, that changes more drastically. So, again, to reiterate that, probably the fourth time I've said it, the longer the term, the more sensitive that price is going to be to a change in the interest rate. Okay, so what have we gone through? Through this video, we have gone through, we now have the ability to determine the present value of future streams of income. Specifically, we've used this as it applies to pricing bonds. Key takeaways, of course, are to be that inverse relationship between the price of a bond and its interest rate. Often that little interest rate, that little I there, we will from time to time refer to that as the yield to maturity. And the reason being is that if you held that bond for that full three-year time period, you didn't sell it in between, that would be your rate of return. That would be your yield if you held it to maturity. So that I and yield to maturity are synonymous in that kind of sense. And so again, I kind of went way about adding stuff in there. But the key takeaway would be that we have this inverse relationship between price and interest rates or between price and yield to maturity, where that interest rate and yield to maturity are synonyms in our case here. If you have any questions on this, a uh, big thing going forward is to be able to calculate price of bonds, to be able to recognize this inverse relationship. Questions that come up, please feel free, post them in the comments below, post them to our D2L Frequently Asked Questions board, and of course, feel free to shoot me an email. Thanks, until next time.